Good morning. We're going to get started. Thank you for coming today. Um, today is the 31st of January, 2020. And this is our second meeting of um, Facility Hardship and Size of Mitigation Program Regulation Reorganization uh, and Changes. Uh, thank you for coming today. Um, we are going to cover our item and then we're going to be opening it up for questions like we normally do. Uh, just a little bit of a recap from last time when we met about three weeks ago. We introduced our new regulation structure for facility hardship. Um, we're going to be doing that today for seismic mitigation. Uh, the, um, our team will get into it a little bit more, but basically it mirrors uh, the same style of organization and the same type of changes we made for uh, the last meeting. So we're just carrying that over to seismic. Um, there's some rules that, uh, that have been tweaked a little bit here and there. We'll highlight those. Um, and um, you'll remember uh, last time we generated some questions. Um, those are uh, addressed in our cover today. Uh, they were largely resulting or were largely surrounding um, reimbursement rules, uh, the rules uh, for appealing things in the program, um, some of the cost estimate particulars, which we're going to get a little bit more into today, and a lot of other things as well. So once again, those are addressed in our cover. Um, We've prepared um, proposed seismic mitigation program regulations as I measure as or as I, as I mentioned. Um, it's also not a major rehaul of the of the rules so much as just the way it's organized and delineated in the regulations. We hope that we've made it a lot more easy to follow and really see the criteria outlined in a way that um, isn't as confusing as it might have been before. Um, we're also going to be talking about, uh, we have another meeting set up in one week from today. Um, it's going to be, I believe, in, I want to say it's in room 444 in the Capitol um, at 9 a.m. next Friday, uh, February the 7th. So we're going to be coming to give, giving you a little bit of a preview of what's going to be at that meeting. Um, we do anticipate that being our final stakeholder meeting for this set of, of rule changes. Um, and we're hoping, uh, we're aiming to take these changes to the February State Allocation Board meeting. So it's a quick track. Um, once again, we welcome any input you have. Uh, if you're watching on the webcast, you're not able to join us today, uh, please feel free to send in any information you'd like for us to consider or any suggestions you might have or questions. We'll be more than happy to look at all of that. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jennifer Mastretti and Silvana Krofcheck, and then we'll open it up for questions when they're done with their presentation. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Jennifer Mistretti. I'm a program services supervisor and at the Office of Public School Construction and also the supervisor at the Facility Hardship and Seismic Mitigation Program. Um, so as we go through the cover item, I'll kind of lead us through it and we'll discuss some of the changes from our last meeting first. So um one of the things that we have done and you'll see in today's packet is there is a separation between the facility hardship program and the seismic mitigation program in our current regulations not the proposed ones that you're looking at in your packet but in our current regulations the programs are integrated and what can happen is there can be some confusion between the rules um, for facility hardship projects versus seismic mitigation program applications and our hope is by it out like this it makes it much more clear what the requirements are for each individual program um, the spirit of the programs is very similar they come from the same section in education code but the filing requirements and the application requirements for the seismic mitigation program are much more specific on the type of documentation that you submit and the type of work that is covered and so again for that reason we hope that splitting it out into two separate sections and being very specific on what the program needs are for each um, would be a benefit to our school districts so with that um, as you saw last well at our last meeting on the 10th um, the facility hardship program is going to be under section 1859.82.1 and therefore the seismic mitigation program will be under the new section 1859.82.2. Um, since our last meeting, throughout the regulations, we fixed some inconsistencies with the numbering, mainly just typo stuff, uh, and then some of the references had typos, so we went through, we cleaned that up. 
We also uh, clarified that districts with small size projects whose applications receive replacement square footage funding will be able to receive that additional grant. Again, it's, um, it's a grant for having smaller size projects. That's an additional grant that's currently an available through the new construction and modernization programs. And the way that the regulations currently calculate it is based off of pupil grants. Well, the vast majority of facility hardship and seismic mitigation program applications are not funded with pupil grants. And for that reason, we wanted to create a way to be able to provide and calculate that grant for replacement applications where you're just replacing an individual school building, not an entire campus. So those regulations, the full text of it will be available at next week's meeting and published probably early to mid next week. Um, but what we did for this version is you'll see that grant referenced in the individual sections where we are saying what type of additional grants you can request for those types of projects. So um, as you'll see in the proposed regulations, both for facility hardship and the seismic mitigation program, there's a very specific listing for which type of additional or supplemental we use the word interchangeably, grants um, that you can request in addition to the main grant that you get just to replace your buildings. Um, each of those sections is different depending on the type of funding you get. So you should now see that grant both under um, the section where you replace an entire school or where you, well, and where you replace entire buildings, both permanent buildings and portable buildings. Okay. And then uh, moving on, another change um, is that in a couple areas, the we fixed the cost benefit analysis calculation. And so what that means is the previous language said that the current replacement cost needed to be above 50% of the minimum work to mitigate a health and safety threat, that's actually backwards. And so we fixed that um, to make it more clear it was an in inadvertent um, mistake in the last version. And then um, we also wanted to clarify that the timing to submit an approved application for funding after receiving design funds um, is based on the project scope. So in the last version of proposed regulations, it said that a district would need to submit their full package for funding um, once they receive their DSA approved plans and their CDE approval. Um, they would need to submit within 18 months of receiving that approval and then 24 months after I think it was project completion. Well, with one of those, it's based off of, no, it was, um, sorry, 18 months after receiving your funding or 24 months after receiving DSA approval. And the point being that one of the criteria was based off of when you get the funding and the other criteria was based off of when you actually get your approval from DSA. We just wanted to align those two things so that it's apples to apples either way that you go. And so um, you can see that change in both the facility hardship and the seismic regulations. And then the last thing we did is there seemed to be some confusion from our last meeting about the language in the regulations that um, was relating to being able to appeal for incomplete applications. So what we did is we removed that um, information, but we kept the language that indicates that incomplete applications will be returned to the school districts unprocessed. Okay, so um, we will not go over individually the questions and answers that we got from our last meeting because they are provided within the cover item that's been provided for today's meeting. But if anybody has any questions or any follow up from them, we would like to welcome you up at the end during our open session and we are happy to address any of those questions that you have. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Silvana for a moment and she can talk about um, the replacement grants that we're proposing to uh, replace portable school buildings. 
Thank you, Jen. So my name is Silvana Krofchek, and I am the project manager for the Facility Hardship and Seismic Mitigation Program within our office. And with the replacement grants for portable skill, school buildings, the intent is to create a grant for districts that the decision to replace means replacing with portables. And right now, our current calculus for replacement square footage for is really geared towards permanent construction, permanent type building construction. And we've recognized that that does not, the costs associated with that permanent construction don't really appropriately translate to the cost from portable construction. So the idea behind proposing this grant for facility hardship projects is to really give the flexibility for districts that are replacing with portable type construction and create a, a grant that's commensurate with that type of construction. So that section would be under 1859.82.1, section little b, 4C, and that can be found on page six of your attachment A packet, which is in the regulations. I first off want to mention that it is specific to the facility hardship section because the criteria for the seismic mitigation program requires a category two type construction that wouldn't really apply to the portable type construction. So it would not, a uh, portable replacement would really wouldn't be eligible under the seismic mitigation program. So with that, the last page of your the packet that was posted for this meeting is attachment D, and we received a piggyback bid for one type of um, one company's portable costs for the year of 2018. And what we did is we focused on the purchase price for classroom space uh, equaling 960 square feet, which is your standard standard portable classroom replacement size, and for bathroom type portable space, that's a 480 square foot type calculation. And we looked at considering the price per square foot, um, and we also included the price for installation and for delivery. And when we looked at this particular bid, the amounts per, per, per square foot would be $93.09 per square foot for a replacement classroom space. And for toilet space, that equals $237.23 for a, a bathroom type portable. Now, this is one particular bid, and we are seeking additional bids in a couple days before this, um, this item was created. We did receive additional stakeholder feedback with additional bids, and thank you so much for that. We are seeking more uh, information to incorporate into our third stakeholder item to get a, a better average, a more comprehensive average for those prices per square foot. Um, and we also want to mention that for this portable grant, the district would also be able to re request site development costs for that replacement project for the portables. And with that, I uh, if I may, just yeah. to tag on to that just a little bit. So uh, Silvana mentioned that uh, the numbers we published in that packet are from 2018. We actually, uh, you'll be able to see the calculations on that sheet there, but we increased it uh, for what would have happened if it were um, in the construction cost index adjustments to the 2020 amount, and that's where the amounts that we put in the regulations came from. So we took the $2018, increased it to what would be reflected in 2020, um, and it would be, um, if we if we proceed with the way it's proposed, it would, it would adjust every year with the CCI. Thank you, Brian. And so with that, we are, again, seeking additional information. So if any stakeholders have further um, quotes that they've received for their portable cost replacements, please feel free to submit that so that we can incorporate that data into our calculation for uh, creating this grant. And with that, I will hand it over to Jen to go over the seismic regulations. Thank you very much, Silvana. Okay, so going over the newly proposed seismic mitigation regulations, the, um, the way that they're written out, the structure and the spirit of it is very, very similar to the facility hardship program, just in specific areas. It's tweaked slightly because of the requirements of the program. So um, changes to um, what's applicable for funding, cost estimates for mitigation costs will be based off of the Sierra West Red Book F3 factor instead of the F2 factor. That would be a higher cost uh, per unit um, than the F2. 
and what we're hoping is that that will more appropriately provide for the unique and increased costs that these types of pro projects usually incur. Additionally, um, we had previously uh, would allow project costs being at F2 by default, and then districts would have to submit significant amounts of information to demonstrate that they would qualify for the F3 level. Um, what would happen is that districts that knew they could do that would submit the information, districts that didn't know that wouldn't. And so to be um, funding at a more equitable rate and also to be funding at a more appropriate rate for what seems to be uh, very challenging and costly work, we believe that allowing districts to request the F3 level of funding through that Sierra West guidebook would be most appropriate. All right, um, the next thing is that projects that receive rehabilitation funding will now be able to request the geographic percentage factor increase. So that's currently under our regulation section 1859.83a. And what that is, is depending on where the school itself is located within California, you may be eligible for an additional percentage increase to your grant. Um, again, it's based off of where the school is, not where the district office is. And um, what we're hoping that will help with is that there are unique areas in California that the cost of construction is higher or labor is higher or it takes more to be able to get your materials to that location. And it seems appropriate that we be able to provide that geographic percentage factor increase to these types of projects. We've heard from districts over a long period of time and also had many districts demonstrate how these costs affect them and so we believe that this is a way that again is going to be universal and equitable and something that we've already provided for our other programs for a significant amount of time to help pay for that difference in cost depending on the location of the school. Um, replacement funding also will be able to use to either replace uh, the buildings that you currently have if you qualify for replacement funding um, or rehabilitate the buildings that you have. So what happened in the past was if you qualified for replacement funding, if you wanted to rehabilitate your buildings, you would have to submit an appeal to the state allocation board requesting that they provide you the replacement funds even though that is not what you're choosing to do with your facilities. That um, no longer will be a requirement. It's going to be a local decision on whether you take your funding and use it to replace or rehabilitate your building. Um, keep in mind that if districts do choose to take the replacement funds and then rehabilitate their building, there are other things that come with that, just like any replacement project. So for example, your modernization eligibility will be reset for the building in which you are replacing. Um, that was a current rule from the facility hardship program, but what we're doing here is we're outlining that um, even if you're not actually replacing your building because you're getting funding to do so, your modernization funding will be reset. And that's clearly outlined in this section of regulations, not just in the section for modernization eligibility adjustments in our regulations. Um, <clears throat> the next thing is that the school capacity and funding is differentiated between standard classrooms and specialized classrooms. And what we mean by that is um, at different times during your application review, we look at how many classrooms you have and what type of classrooms they are to help determine how much funding that you will get for your project. More for replacement, not so much for rehabilitation projects. But um, an example of this could be that, let's say you have 20 classrooms at your school and one classroom needs replacement and you have um, the enrollment that justifies having 10 classrooms. So the question comes in as to if the minimum work is to have the pupils housed in some of the other 10 classrooms and not pay for the replacement of that one classroom because your enrollment wouldn't necessarily justify the need for it. So with this, what we'll do is instead of saying you have 20 classrooms no matter what it type they are, um, versus 10 classrooms, no matter what type they are, we are gonna take a critical eye to what type of classrooms they are and how we count them. So for example, 
If you have a band classroom that has been designed and built in a specialized way, so maybe it has tiers um, or it's a certain shape uh, that makes it not really um, a good learning environment for just any other type of class, English, math, whatever it is, then we can consider that to be more of a specialized classroom. That would also apply for something maybe like auto shop or wood shop where you're out in a completely different setting and you have the large um, equipment and materials around you. It's a completely different environment than what you would potentially need for more um, learning that's taught at where a student's sitting in their desk and looking at a whiteboard more typically. Um, so with those things, we'll be able to take that into consideration when we're doing the classroom counts and also when we're doing the replacements as well. And then what comes with that is in, um, when we're looking at funding replacement buildings, we look at um, a chart in our regulations. Now, there is a new chart in the seismic uh, section. It's exactly the same as the one that's in the facility hardship section. And what is new, both for a facility hardship and seismic, is that specialized classrooms have a minimum amount of space that can be provided for them. So before we were really just looking at 960 square feet per classroom because that is what Title V had outlined, but we went ahead and broke that out because there are circumstances where, for example, a home economics class or a science lab may justify a larger amount of space. So that would be approximately 1,350 square feet. So you'll see that on the chart as well. Um, <clears throat> The next uh, and last part of the funding criteria that's changed is that districts will have more flexibility to choose which enrollment reporting year that they use to calculate their replacement grant. So what we're gonna do is we wanna work with districts to help maximize their funding, but also one thing that we're considering is that if you have a severe health and safety threat at your site, you may have been losing enrollment up to the point of fixing that um, building. So for example, um, if you're filing your application and we're looking at just that the year in which you have filed your application, that enrollment reporting year, it really may not be an accurate depiction of what your enrollment has been over a certain period of time because of the fact that you lost students because you couldn't use that classroom building or because you haven't been able to use um, certain facilities on your site and children have then been transported to other school sites. So with this, um, there's a couple different options that districts will be able to choose when we're working with you to figure out which re enrollment reporting year or which average of years you should use to determine um, the amount of replacement funding you'll get based off of the number of pupils that you had at your site. Another example of that would be like if your school site has closed, if for some reason you had to close your entire school, well your current enrollment would be zero, but that doesn't make any sense when calculating um, what your replacement grants would be based off of what your current enrollment is. So we wanted to provide alternatives for that uh, circumstance as well. <clears throat> So as Silvana mentioned, we have not included in the seismic regulations language for districts to be able to replace their portable buildings. And that's because we have not found under any circumstance in which a portable building um, as defined by education code would qualify for the seismic mitigation program. We've also never seen or funded one thus far in our program, but if anybody has heard of that, um, we would love to get more information because we're open to changing it if that is a circumstance that districts may have. It's just not one that we have been able to conceive of thus far. Okay, so the next area that we'll go over is program criteria. So we wanted to increase clarification on what's needed for applications requesting funding for mold, lead, or friable asbestos mitigation as part of their minimum work to mitigate a seismic threat. So this is different than our conversation that we've had for the facility hardship program. So with that program, there are circumstances in which mold 
<clears throat> for example, would be your health and safety threat that then leads into the justification for needing your facilities to be repaired, rehabilitated, or replaced. That's really not what we're talking about here for the seismic mitigation program. The focus for this program is to be able to mitigate the seismic threats due to faulting, liquefaction, landslide, or ground shaking potential. But we have found that in doing those that rehabilitation work or even that replacement work during demolition or um, <clears throat> other type of work that these items are found mold, lead, or asbestos, and there is um, specialized mitigation that the district has to take on. Um, for example, they may need to bring in a specialized company to be able to do the demolition work and be able to package it appropriately and dispose of it appropriately, and that does cost more um, than a project that does not have that. And a lot of these buildings that we have found or that have been found to qualify for the program are older buildings in which these would be issues. So we wanted to clarify that if this type of mitigation is part of the minimum work to be able to re rehabilitate your facilities or even demolish and replace them, then a district could include those costs on their cost <coughs> estimate for the program, but we do also need the reports demonstrating that there is a presence of mold, lead, or friable asbestos. So if the district demonstrates that they have those items, um, we will be able to partner in the funding of it. All right, so the next thing is that we also wanted to clarify that only uh, school buildings that have interior square footage would need to prepare prepare and provide a cost benefit analysis with their project. So this is to differentiate between covered walkways or lunch shelters. Those um, facilities, they don't have interior square footage and therefore when we do our calculation for the current replacement cost, it really isn't applicable. That um, calculation, the current replacement cost um, formula is based off of permanent interior square footage. So if you do that calculation compared to a covered walkway, you're almost never gonna qualify for replacement. But if you do, the funding may also not be appropriate for it because that isn't the type of space it's meant to replace. So for that reason, covered walkways and lunch shelters will still be eligible for the seismic mitigation program, but it will always be considered a rehabilitation project. So you'll fill out whatever the costs are based off of your cost estimate and submit those. And we understand that that might be replacement and you may include the replacement cost of that covered walkway. It's just a different method. So instead of getting the funding based off of this formula that really isn't meant for that type of facility, you'll be able to put in what the actual, not actual cost, but what the costs are within the Sierra West guideline for F3 for what a covered walkway or a lunch shelter is. Um, and then the next part of that is that um, just like for the facility hardship program, we wanted to specifically outline the cases in which a seismic mitigation program application can affect a district's eligibility um, for the new construction or modernization program. So just like the facility hardship program, a district does not need to use their eligibility for the modernization or new construction program to be able to get funding for the seismic mitigation program. But for example, as I mentioned earlier, if a district gets funding to replace their building, under the seismic mitigation program, their modernization eligibility will be reset for that building. So that was already outlined in the section for modernization eligibility adjustments, but we wanted to make sure that we put it within these regulations as well. So it's very clear that it's not just buried somewhere else where a district isn't really looking at that part of the regs when they're focused on this application. It's there um, in this specific section too. Same with uh, new construction eligibility. So if a district decides to increase the capacity of their site while they're doing their seismic project, so for example, maybe you demolish four classrooms and you're building back 10, um, whenever you increase that capacity, it can influence your new construction eligibility. So we've outlined that as well. And that is also something that was already pre-existing in the regulations in the new construction eligibility offset section, but we wanted to pull it in and make sure it's all contained within this seismic section. So it's not like 
an Easter egg hunt trying to figure out all the requirements for your project. Um, okay, so the next is that the district must use an OPSC provided cost estimate template for outlining the minimum mitigation work and costs required. So we're really excited about the cost estimate template that we've developed. We think it will be tremendously helpful for school districts. We um, are doing the finalization on the tweaks and stuff that we'll need for it. It will be considered an official form and we are going to be publishing it early next week for you to be able to review and for us to be able to discuss at next week's meeting on the 7th. Um, and then the last part is clarification on application <coughs> submittal criteria and funding um, calculations for applications that request the seismic mitigation program advance funding for design costs. So currently the section that discusses what you need to submit for a design application for the seismic mitigation program mirrors very, very closely to what it is for the facility hardship program. Um, I will let you know that we have made some additions to this section that you'll be able to see next week. Basically what that is, is we wanted to, um, compared to the version you're looking at now, we wanted to expand what the actual documents are that you'll be required to submit for a design application. And then um, we are also going to very clearly outline exactly how you calculate your design grant. Now, there are ways that we can just point to other sections, which is kind of what it does right now. It says, you know, if you want design funding, it's going to be calculated in accordance to dot 811E. Okay, well then you again need to go to another section to try to figure out what that is. And that section was really geared toward new construction and modernization programs. So instead of doing that, we wanted to very clearly outline exactly how you do the calculation for which type of seismic or facility hardship program application you have. So you'll be able to see those additions next week. Um, and then lastly, we can go through the organization changes that we've done. As we've already discussed multiple times, there's the separation of the facility hardship and seismic mitigation program criteria into two different sections. Um, we have a significant amount of increased enumeration for clarification and section references. And then um, we wanted to provide a clear outline for all the documents that are necessary for a complete application submittal and outline them individually based off of what type of application you'll be submitting. Um, with that, those are the main changes that we're presenting for the seismic mitigation program. I'm going to go over our next steps real quick and then we would love to open it up to public comment um, or any questions that people may have. So. The first thing is that at next week's meeting, uh, as I mentioned, we're going to go over that cost estimate template. It's not huge, complicated, anything like that. It'll be published in just a couple days and you'll be able to review it. And please provide us any feedback if you think that there's something that needs to be added to it, for example. Um, we are planning on providing that. We're looking at doing a PDF or Excel kind of versions to make it as easy as possible on the districts as well. And then also like pre-fill in the soft costs for it. Um, and you'll also see next week that the type of soft, soft costs that we provide for is expanded um, and outlined very clearly where that authority is and what percentages they should be and why. So that'll be great. If you see anything additional that you think is missing or should be different, we would love your feedback on that too. Um, the portable replacement grant. So we're hoping to be able to get a little bit more feedback on that, just like Silvana said. So we'll be able to finalize more of what we're looking at as providing for those grants, both at 100% what that would be, how much funding you would get if you um, are partnering with the state and you get a 50% amount of what that total portable cost is or if you qualify for financial hardship and you would get up to 100% of what that is. Um, and then with that, we'll also be able to outline what the current replacement costs for portables are, both for toilets and for classroom portables or other portable space. Um, we're also going to do an addition to the regulations where we're going to outline the state agency approvals that district needs to have a complete application. So right now we outline um, 
the other types of documents that a district would need. So an industry specialist report, a cost estimate, a cost benefit analysis, that kind of thing. But we don't actually specifically outline that you need division of the state architect approval or an exemption letter. Um, approval from the California Department of Education or an exemption letter, that kind of stuff. So while the criteria is the same as it is for the new construction and modernization program and that it's discussed on the application for funding form 5004, just like a lot of these other changes, we wanted it to be very clear. So we're just gonna put it right there in the regulations that this is what you'll need to be able to submit a complete application. And then um, we're going to bring back any comments or questions that we receive from this meeting at that meeting, just like we have today in our question and answer section in our cover. And then um, we may have changes. Oh, we will also have the changes to the other sections of the SFP regulations as a result of these proposed regulations. Um, I will tell you that. Next, the packet with the regulations that include everything that needs to be changed in the SFP regs, 99.5% of that is just changing the reference sections because as you can tell, we don't have just 1859.82 anymore. It's like 82.1, 82.2, and both of those have now replaced um, 83E and therefore 83F will become 83E. So there's kind of a waterfall effect when you have these types of changes. Um, one of the larger changes that you'll see is that we do have proposed regulations in that packet for how to calculate small size project for um, applications that receive replacement funding through that square footage grant since it's not calculated off of pupil grants, which is how it's currently outlined in the regulations. So that's I think the largest addition. Um, and uh, so we'll be, again, we'll be posting that shortly and we really look forward to receiving your feedback. The way that that will be outlined will be very clear too. So anything that's been deleted from our regulations will be red with a, uh, the color red with a struck through. And then anything new will be blue and underlined. Anything that's currently existing and is going to remain will be black. So hopefully it will be very, very clear what's new, what's different, what's going away, and what's being added. Um, and with that, that's all we have for our presentation. And we would like to welcome any comments or feedback that people have. Appreciate that button. It's on now. Hello, all. Uh, Jamie Green, Trinity Alps Unified School District Superintendent. First of all, I'd like to commend you for how hard that you guys have worked to uh, constantly improve your program. We can see that it's a living document. I've learned a lot since June, since we had toxic mold close our main campuses at our elementary school and our high school. And I appreciate that you've been partners from the start. We've been We've been getting help from you guys to get in service on what to do. I think there's a large issue where we've always assumed that the air inside of buildings is safe. We've always done that. I did that until June. And something that I've learned is the price of technology has went down by so much that the cost of ignorance is going to go up. So there are ways that we could do preventative maintenance. So as a superintendent, this is on me. We need to do preventative maintenance. We need to change our air filters. We need to look at water intrusion areas immediately. And I think that's a large, a large item to get out to all the schools that we all work together. You at OPSC are phenomenal at helping us. Um, as educators, we need to be prepared and the message needs to get out. How often are you changing your air filters? When you have a leak in your school, is that important that within a certain amount of time you've dealt with that? And I think the technology has uh, risen to a point where we could do the preventative on this and it could help other schools and other students not being out of classrooms. So I think a large piece of this is a preventative piece that we look at it. Um, as for the system, I've gotten emails at eight o'clock at night from your office. I've gotten emails on Saturday. So I completely feel like a partnership. We put a bond on the agenda. We uh, 
absolutely do not feel something happens at your school, it's up to the state to completely come in and fix that. And we appreciate the fact that um, our community, and we're working on it right now, is understanding that. Local control funding talks about the local community being part of the school. The LCAP definitely talks about bringing in private business and bringing people in. As a partnership, we can get through this. Um, so with, with that, I would like to thank you guys. The changes you made are absolutely spot on because I've been in this for the last seven months and I'm absolutely amazed in that short amount of time that you guys have listened to your stakeholders and you're making movement uh, to forward to help that. This is an easy process for anybody. I'd also like to say you guys are very good counselors and working with the public. Um, you get people that are in trauma calling you and you constantly call me because um, I'm like, hey, what do we do? I just closed all my buildings. And you guys said, okay, we're going to come walk your campus and really appreciate how transparent and how brutally honest you guys are as well. You don't sugarcoat things. We appreciate that. You don't try to lead us down a road where this may or use the word likely, that likely this will happen. Um, you made everything clear and, uh, and we appreciate that. So I think in the future, I think it's important that we as a state that we look at air quality inside and really work on the preventative. I know LA Unified did a big item with changing their air filters and we all saw how their test scores went up with that. So I don't think that's necessarily on the backs of uh, OPSC. I think we need to work together over the next several years. We have the greatest university system in the world. We have the UC, we have the CSU system. I think research needs to be done on indoor air quality and with that, we could all put together the preventative piece, and then OPSC can really focus on building new buildings, which they love to do. But I wanted to personally thank you for my entire community, my 700 students, my school board, that we felt like royalty throughout the whole process, and uh, just want to thank you. So thank you for all that. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, you're being modest. Uh, you, you're a great uh, proponent for your district and for our program as well. We appreciate your help as well. Um, and I think you bring up a really good point about uh, preventative measures. Um, and I think that we're at a time right now where we're all learning a lot more about mold and um, the problems it presents and you know how severe or maybe in some cases not severe it may be. Um, our program is always gonna be there for those cases that are beyond the preventative point, but I think you bring up a really good point. I think the more that we learn together, the more that we're able to educate ourselves and to help our school district clients and um, anybody out in the school community to learn more about mold, I think the less of it we'll have in the future. So we'll be able to do those preventive things that you're talking about and kind of see it coming. So I, we really appreciate your help as well. And um, as with your district and any other district, we're in a partnership here. Um, this is our program um, together. So uh, we really appreciate those comments and we appreciate all of your help as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. So one quick example, this morning at 6 a.m., I got a picture from our facilities person that there was a water spot on a tile in the ceiling. Both principals got woke up, our CBO got woke up, we got a ladder out, we are up. It's just, it's a matter, you don't know what you know until you know it. We had no clue about that. So we probably had 500 tiles and a lot of superintendents will tell you they have water spots. It's as simple as if you don't have a water spot on your tile, you don't have water coming from somewhere. So today that is our purpose, but that may have went six, eight, 10 months before saying, yeah, there's water up there, we'll look at it. Well, 48 hours later, you have mold. And so we're all over that tile. I just wanted to report that to you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, Rob Murray with King Consulting. And just want to echo the sentiments of just thank you for the time and effort you've put into this. Uh, really, I think a lot of the stakeholders appreciate a lot of what's in the changes to the regulations. But I'm just going to take you up on your offer on the yeah. Q&A on item three to hear additional feedback on the conceptual approval point. Uh, and just if the value of a conceptual approval outweighs uh, the concern about uh, some of the parameters changing in between that initial conceptual approval and the eventual uh, full body of the application and funding. And just want to reiterate that from our uh, perspective and our clients' perspectives with whom we've helped with this process, that is a hands down yes. They really, really want that initial reinsurance of just here's the situation we have, maybe even here's our industry expert letter that we have. 
uh, they just want that reassurance that there isn't just a hard no, just this in no way qualifies for the program, don't put any more resources into this, mm -hmm. let's look for a different avenue. But because a lot of districts they might have uh, you know, some other avenues they could explore, uh, offloading students to a different site where if they don't want uh, necessarily unless they know that they have the facility hardship program aiding them, they don't want to allocate some of their incredibly finite resources towards something if they have another option that they can do. And I think that's where that conceptual approval early in the process just really helps them out and uh, you know, definitely would just really appreciate knowing that that's something that is uh, kind of formally in place. Thanks. Uh, I wanted to ask um, on this topic, I'm glad that you brought it up, Ron, mm -hmm. thank you. Um, you know, if OPSC were to provide um, some kind of um, assurance in writing from mm. our staff, um, official letterhead, whatever you'd like, uh, would that, do you think, provide the same level of um, assurance or same level of confidence with the with the school and the school board? I, um, I know you can't speak for all of them. Yeah, I can't, but, not speaking for everyone, but for myself, I feel like, yes, that would. Okay. Because um, I think we're, um, you know, we've always been willing to do that. Uh, we, we always will uh, look at things and, um, you know, provide our opinion on it. And of course, mm -hmm. we're going to caveat it, you know, if um, things change or so forth. But I think that's something that we'd be willing to do maybe in lieu of conceptual approval. I don't think we're closing the door on that, but um, we're just, we're, we're kind of looking at options there. What, you know, what, what could we, um, trying to, trying to kind of make the most of our, of all of our time. Um, and that's one of the options I think that we would we would propose is that we could provide you with some sort of assurance on the staff level, right? And that, yeah, I think that's very much in line with what we're okay. uh, just talking about hoping for. So thank you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks. And to um, build on that a little bit too yeah. is that um, we're wanting to take a critical eye to how we can really best help the district. So we mm -hmm. historically have had this conceptual approval um, method, but something we've been doing more and more often lately mm -hmm. is really talking to districts from the very beginning. So when we had conceptual approvals, not always, but sometimes they would just show up on our desk and we didn't know anything about the application. Mm -hmm. We would review them and go through them and work with the district, of course. But what has been really nice now, um, too, is having more and more districts call and say, I just discovered this problem. Mm -hmm. I didn't really know you existed. What, mm -hmm. like, talk to me all about it. And so we can come in and help the district even earlier in the process mm -hmm. and kind of talk through, okay, not just facility hardship, not just conceptuals, but hey, while I have you on the phone, like, let's look at any other options you may have to either like partner this together or not. Like, for example, modernization eligibility, new construction eligibility, um, the career technical education program is something that's partnered with some of our projects recently. Mm -hmm. And so what we're able to do is um, when we have those conversations too, is really look holistically from an earlier point of view to help build on that. And then also, um, I think one of the questions that we had last week was, well, we're concerned about the timing of being able to submit an application because districts don't know that your program exists and so we shouldn't limit the submittal time. And I hear that, but one thing that um, resonated with me is that, well, I'm not sure if the issue is the timing or if the issue is that people don't know that the program exists. And so that's where we want to hone in on what is the actual issue? What is the assurance that districts want? Do they really want to have like that piece of paper with an estimated amount? Probably. But do they also want to be able to just have some sort of method that they can have direct communication with us and we can look at their district holistically, their site holistically for our whole program, not just this one, and then walk them through what their options for funding would be. And so that's what we're kind of wanting to look at in a bigger frame too, is that while there are a lot of people that really liked like that historical conceptual approval, like maybe there's a different method that would mm -hmm. be even better. And so that's something that we appreciate your feedback on, mm -hmm. and we appreciated the other feedback we got on um, the first meeting because we can continue to think about like how can we really best serve our stakeholders. Okay, no, that's great. Thank you. Yeah, we, you know, we're also we're willing to, and uh, we already do this, but um, we're willing to look at your reports. You know, basically um, everything short of, I guess, SAB approval. Um, you know, we we would still provide the same type of review we would for a conceptual approval. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
So. That's great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Other comments or questions? I'm going to give it a little time here. Uh, we do have we do have our third meeting next week. Um, like I, like we've mentioned multiple times already, that will be another opportunity. But I would encourage you if you have things to say today um, to take advantage of your opportunity because we'll be able to give it that much more thought and incorporate it that much more into our item for next week. Um, again, for those of you that aren't here in person, um, you can send it to us either via email or letter. We'll accept that as well. But um, there's a few of you out there. I know you guys came for a reason today. <clears throat> Going once. All right, well, um, I suppose that's a testament to our staff work, um, we hope. <laughs> um, once again, we do have a meeting next week. We'll be looking forward to seeing some of the same faces, I'm sure, then. Um, if anything crosses your mind in the meantime, um, we're very open to listening to all of them. We'll consider them all. Um, give us a call, send us a letter, send us an email. And I guess if there is nothing else, um, then we will... See you next week. Thank you. Thank you.